This week in IT, everyone's talking about GPT-5, but Microsoft could be the biggest winners sneaking in new AI integrations. Plus, we've got a new Entra ID security flaw that could allow attackers to bypass FIDO authentication. And there's a new way to run Office apps right from your Windows taskbar. Let's break it all down. Welcome to This Week in IT, the show where I talk about everything connected to Windows, Microsoft 365 and Azure. Before I get started today, I've got a quick favour to ask you. About 38% of the people who watched last week's video weren't subscribed to the channel. Now, as we go live today, we're on 13,090 subscribers. I'd love it if we could push that above 13,100 this week. So if you'd like to see these weekly news updates from Petri.com, please subscribe to the channel and don't forget to hit the bell notification to make sure that you don't miss out on the latest uploads. Last week, I mentioned the introduction of GPT-5 to ChatGPT and to the various versions of Copilot that Microsoft has across its products and services. Now, I'm not going to go into too much about what GPT-5 is offering. I'll just give you a quick summary right now in case you didn't hear, but there's been a lot of chatter about this new model during the week. So with GPT-5, essentially you get what's called a smart mode or dynamic model routing. So it chooses the best model for the question that you're going to ask. Does it need to think deeply and take a bit more time or can it give you a quick response? OpenAI says that it has a better context and dialogue flow and that it can perform advanced reasoning tasks. Now, when GPT-5 was released last week, there was a big fanfare about how this is an important step on the road to general intelligence. But Sam Altman said that while this is a significant progress, this is not general artificial intelligence quite yet. Now, of course, as people have got their hands on this technology over the last few days, they've started to see, is it really the big step forwards that OpenAI has been promising? And it seems that this isn't such a big jump from a GPT-4. Now, whilst there are some great things about this, that in principle it hallucinates less, that it responds faster, a lot of people are saying that it doesn't produce as good results as the previous model, especially people who are using it to produce code. They say that GPT-5 is essentially breaking a lot of their workflows that they built around artificial intelligence and the results that it's producing are not just as good. Now, of course, that could be to do with the fact that you get the option uh, to use the smart mode here. So it's automatically picking a processing model for your questions. But because of all the fuss there's been this week, week, OpenAI has essentially allowed people who have got a subscription to the platform to now go back and choose one of the legacy models manually if they don't want the new smart mode from GPT-5. Starting August 11, OpenAI also started to roll out new connectors. Now, they talked about this last week, and I mentioned it in the video, that there are connectors for Gmail and Google Suite Calendar, whatever they're calling the enterprise version of Gmail these days. And there was not much mention of Microsoft. In fact, there was no real mention at all in the press. So I went digging a little bit deeper to find out that there are actually connectors for Microsoft 365 services. Some of them already existed prior to the GPT. GPT-5 announcement last week, but there were some new ones that were released on August 11, namely Outlook Calendar, Outlook Mail, and a Teams connector. Now, what already existed before August 11th was a connector for OneDrive and SharePoint libraries. So they're just expanding on the number of connectors available. Now, I have to say that there's a lot I have you know, to learn about OpenAI chat GPT and artificial intelligence in general. I'm just scratching the surface of what you can do with it really, with the, whether it's chat GPT or whether it's co-pilot. So I'm trying to advance my knowledge and really understand how these technologies work. I recently created my first ever agent using Copilot Studio, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. But it's interesting that these connectors, first of all, you have to understand that they operate 
across the different modes in chat GPT. So whether it's chat or whether it's deep thinking or whether it's agent mode, there have been some restrictions around these Google connectors. So I think that's slowly starting to change this week. There has also been some restrictions on the geographies in which they're available. So for some reason, these new connectors have not been available in the EU and the UK. I believe uh, ChatGPT, or OpenAI, I should probably say, is starting to rectify that and make these connectors available more broadly. Now, you should also understand about connectors is most of you are probably going to be using them in chat and you actually have to enable them every time you start a new chat. So if you enable one of these connectors in the settings, you make the connection and you just say, go and check my email for new messages, for instance, the chat box will just say, mm, I can't connect to your Outlook, even though you've set up that connection. You need to go down to the plus dialog at the bottom of the chat and specifically enable connectors and which connectors you want to work for this specific chat. So that's something that I didn't know. And it's also important to understand that connectors are read only. So I assume that these connectors work with some kind of MCP server. Now, MCP servers in principle can do whatever the MCP server is set up to do. So if there are APIs in the service that allow you to write back to a database or perform particular actions, then the MCP server should allow you to do that. But as far as I can understand from OpenAI's documentation, when it's implemented in the form of a connector, it's read only. So you can query your Outlook email, your Gmail email, or your calendar, but as soon as you ask it to do something, then yep, that's not gonna happen not with a chat GPT connector at least. Now I did a little bit of experimenting. I connected my Google Gmail and my Outlook email to my chat GPT. I have, I think, an enterprise subscription. So this may not be available across all subscriptions right now, but I was able to query my Outlook email and uh, for a specific thing, I can't remember what the query was. I think I asked it to list all the recent emails where I talked about a specific subject and it did it pretty quickly and pretty accurately. Uh, but that's you know where it ends. It's just about querying Outlook, not about actually responding or taking action on anything at this stage, at least. So that got me thinking, well, OK, what if you actually do want to take an action? Does that mean you always need to have an agent set up to actually perform actions? And I think the answer is kind of yes, but maybe not. So let me explain that a little bit. So ChatGPT, for instance, has a thing called a virtual browser. I've never used it myself, but what it essentially allows you to do is open up a website. So that could be Gmail or Outlook.com, for instance, and then literally have it click and point in different places to perform an action. Now, I don't think that's an especially efficient way to perform an action. It's better to connect in with an API and do it through an agent, in my opinion. I then kind of started thinking in Microsoft 365 Copilot, what if you want to perform actions? Do you always have to have an agent? And again, I think it, it maybe depends on what it is that you're trying to do. So I opened the Copilot chat in Microsoft 365 and asked it to send an email on my behalf. It just said essentially it can't do it, but it will give me the instructions about how I can do it manually. I was like, oh, okay. I then asked it to create a new calendar appointment at a specific time for a specific length of time. And it said also that it couldn't do that, but it would provide me with a link and help me do it manually. So out of interest, I just clicked on the link and it automatically created a new calendar event at the right time with the right duration, but without the title of the calendar event. So it took me to Outlook and it actually brought me with a new event window with some of the information that I wanted pre-populated. So it did part of it for me, but couldn't go the whole way. Then I thought, well, okay, what if I use the copilot that's integrated into Outlook? I asked it to do the same things, to send an email on my behalf and to create a new calendar event. Interestingly, it said that it would send an email on my behalf, 
but actually didn't do it. So it says that it does something, but doesn't do it. I also asked it to create a new calendar event. And again, it said that, yep, I'm going to add this event to your calendar. Did it appear on my calendar? No. So that was interesting. And I think it's these kind of things that could lead to a lot of confusion for end users where AI is saying that it does something. It's like an action hallucination, if you like, but actually just doesn't do it at all. Having said all of that, I created my first agent last week in Copilot Studio. I get a lot of email requests every week from different companies and organizations asking if they can publish content on Petri. Most of these uh, requests are what I would say bogus in that they break Google's best practices in terms of SEO. They want to pay for a do follow link and all of this stuff. I won't bore you with the SEO issues around all of that kind of thing, but it's very rarely that I get a request that I would actually consider to be something genuine that I would think about. So what I asked it to do is to do some deep analysis on the email and to essentially flag any requests that seem like they might be genuine. And I've had that running for over a week now and it works pretty well. You know, 90% of all the requests that I get are just rubbish, should be binned, but anything that has come through that I should look at, to my surprise, it has flagged. Now, I had to set up an agent to do that. It wasn't something that I could just perform in the Copilot chat. But for me at this stage, it's just really understanding exactly what I can do in chat, where the limitations of that are, when I need to create an agent. And of course, the advantage of something like Copilot is that it automatically has access to all of the data in my tenant that you know uh, I have access to or the user account I give to the agent has access to, I should say. And Copilot Studio is essentially a way that you can build an agent using natural language and features that are already built into Microsoft 365, all the power platform stuff that you may already be familiar with. So that's a big advantage too. Let me know what you think about GPT-5. Are you using it? Have you used any of these new connectors? Do you think they're useful or are they just too limited? I'd love to know what you think in the comments below. Researchers at Proofpoint have outlined a new FIDO downgrade attack against Entra ID. Now, this is quite concerning because essentially it uses a man in the middle technique to trick whatever browser you're using to access a particular service to determine that, that in fact the browser doesn't support this kind of pass key uh, authentication and you need to instead use one of your fallback methods. So that could be sending a verification code by SMS or using a code from your authenticator app. The problem is when it falls back to that mode, it's then able to capture that information and the token and then to essentially log on as you to that service. So this is quite worrying. Now they've got a proof of concept uh, against Entra ID, but I suppose in principle, this might also work against other directory services. Of course, the whole point of pass keys and FIDO authentication is that they should be uh, passwordless and they should be resistant to credential phishing because you're not exchanging any credentials. There are no credentials to steal. But once you start using one of the fallback methods, then of course, you're suddenly going back to some kind of information that is being exchanged with the server, whether it be a code or a password or both potentially. It doesn't seem that this exploit is being used in the wild yet, but of course that could happen at any point in the near future. So what can you do to protect yourself against this kind of threat? You could think about disabling fallback methods of authentication. I'm not sure whether that's possible to do in Microsoft 365, but that does worry me a little bit. What if the pass key stops working or the user loses access to a device? That's going to potentially cause them a big login issue. You could use access policies to check for changes to the type of login that a user is using and create an alert. So that every time there's an unexpected change in authentication method, that raises some kind of red flag. If you're using Entra ID, it might be worth just revising what your policies are for all of those 
moving parts just to make sure that if this does become widespread, you are protected until there is some workaround about how we can actually prevent this at a better level. I forgot to say at the very beginning, they're able to do this by tricking the browser into thinking that essentially it's Safari on Windows. Safari on Windows, for whatever reason, doesn't support FIDO authentication. So this is kind of a trick to make it think like Edge or Chrome or something like that that does support FIDO authentication is actually running Safari and forces Entra ID to flip to one of the fallback methods. Last year's Ignite, Microsoft announced that it was releasing free companion apps for Office on Windows 11 that will be accessible from the taskbar. So these are a contacts app that will be essentially access to the organizational chart, file search that will allow simple keyword search of your Microsoft 365 data, and a calendar app for viewing events and joining meetings. Now, I haven't used these apps myself. They're supposed to be rolling out to business users this month. I think it's something that you have to enable. They're not just going to suddenly appear. So you need to look into that if you're an IT administrator and your users want access to them. I think a lightweight calendar app is something that could be really useful. For me personally, I'm not sure that a people app that allows me to search for people, start conversations and see an organizational chart is especially beneficial, but that's really gonna depend on the size of the organization that you're working for, I guess. Of course, the bigger the organization, the harder it is to find the right people that you need to speak to. What confuses me a little bit is the file app that's essentially allowing you to search for things and then potentially share whatever it is that you find. And um, now this isn't using natural language search or anything that we have now in Copilot Plus PCs. But what I can't understand is all the different ways for searching. Why we don't have one place in Windows where we can search across the local PC and any cloud services that we're connected to like Microsoft 365 and be able to use natural language. I thought that that's where we were heading with these features that are being added to Copilot Plus PCs. So I'm not quite sure about this file app and the restricted search just for your Microsoft 365 data. I don't like the idea of restricting search to something particular. Very often, you know, users, people are working across different applications and devices and they just want to be able to search, not to be able to search just in one particular silo. So I'm a little bit uh, divided about that. I guess we'll have to see how well it works in principle and what the usage of that application is once it actually gets launched and rolled out to more people. If you found this video useful, I'd really appreciate it if you gave it a thumbs up because it helps to get it seen by more people on YouTube. This week, uh, Microsoft has again been talking about the vision for Windows. And last week, uh, David Weston was talking about the security vision for Windows, along with, uh, along with some AI predictions that he has for the operating system by 2030. So who knows, we could be seeing Windows 12 at that point. I'm going to leave another video on the screen all about that now that's interesting. So please do check that out. But that's it for me for this week, and I'll see you next time.